Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, everybody who's joining us. Um, I want to tell you about my new book, but the story begins eight and a half years ago when I started the Everyday Sexism Project. That project was started for a very simple reason, because it seemed that people, in particular women and girls, were experiencing an overwhelming amount of sexism, gender discrimination, um, sexual violence, workplace discrimination, sexual abuse on a regular basis. But at the time, when I tried to talk about sexism, I came up against a brick wall. People told me, men and women are equal now, there isn't any such thing as sexism anymore. And I felt that I couldn't solve a problem if people didn't know it existed. So the premise of the project was very simple. It was a website where anybody, anywhere, people of any gender could share their own experience. And together we could look at those en masse and recognize hopefully the scale of the problem. I didn't think I could fix the problem overnight, but I thought that if people didn't even know it existed, it would be very difficult to fix it. And having started that project, which was so very simple, which simply provided a platform for anybody to share their own experience, the backlash was very swift and very acute. I soon learned that there was a broad online community of men who hate women, and I learned it because they got in touch. Because if you are a feminist writer, a feminist activist, really even if you're a woman with an opinion online, you quickly become aware of these communities or of some members of them. I started to realize that there were pretty vast and sprawling communities of these men that when they would band together and, and arrange to send me messages on the same day. So that for example, on a bad day, I might get 200 messages and this has gone on for eight and a half years detailing which seven weapons they might use to disembowel me with before they raped me, uh, detailing how they would lie in wait for me and where they would be and how they would videotape murdering me and put it on the internet or whatever it was that day. But there was a school of thought at the time that it was best not to give these groups the oxygen of publicity, that we knew that they existed, but talking about them and bringing them into the spotlight would be to be giving them a platform. And I really was quite sympathetic with that view. So I largely kept quiet about this stuff and I carried on with the work I was doing. And it seemed to me that the most pragmatic way to tackle gender inequality was to focus on schools, to talk to young people, to open up opportunities for them to have conversations about gender stereotypes and the way that they affected all of them, about their career aspirations and the role models that they saw in the media, about the way that those women were portrayed and affected, about the way the media presented men and women, about sexual consent, healthy relationships, you name it. So for eight years, I went into perhaps on average two schools a week all over the country to have these conversations. And of course, it was uncomfortable and tricky and there was some resistance and things were difficult at first. But generally speaking, we managed to have a fantastic conversation most of the time until a couple of years ago when I noticed that something strange was happening. I'd arrive at schools and find enormous and angry resistance from boys who weren't prepared to have a conversation, who weren't open to listening, who already had very extreme and very ingrained beliefs about feminazis hating men, about white men being the true oppressed class of our times, about a wave of false rape allegations and the fact that the majority of allegations were false, about men in their droves losing their jobs to angry women making up completely false stories and employers who were prepared to sack men with no kind of basis in truth or any kind of investigation. And they were so confident about this that I started to feel it was a form of radicalization, particularly when I noticed that these boys were coming out with the exact same words and phrases at schools from rural Scotland to inner city London. They were even using the same false statistics to back up their arguments. And I suddenly put two and two together one day when they started, I started to ask them, how do you know? Where have you heard this? And they started to give me names that I connected back to these extremist communities of men who hate women that I was aware of online. At that point, I realized that these communities had morphed and spread to such an extent that they were no longer tiny internet cul-de-sacs that we could starve of the oxygen of publicity. They were actually doing very well with propaganda by themselves, but they were infiltrating and affecting teenage boys to such a degree that if we didn't talk about it and we weren't able to tackle it, then we were doing a real disservice to those boys and by extension to their female peers. 
So I went undercover to investigate what's loosely known as the Manosphere. It's a connection of different online communities. And for a period of 18 months, I posed as a very ordinary white middle class um, man in his early 20s named Alex, who was disillusioned with the world and the idea that everybody seemed to think he had this thing called privilege. And I watched as Alex was gradually drawn in to a web of uh, websites, forums, platforms, groups, communities, vloggers, and I started to recognize that this was massive. The groups I investigated included incels or involuntary celibates who believe that women are deliberately denying them sex and deserve to be raped or murdered as a result. It might sound extreme until you think, for example, about Elliot Roger, who went offline specifically in the name of this incel ideology, murdered six people and seriously injured 14 in Santa Barbara. Or Alec Manassian, the driver of the van in the Toronto van attack, who again explicitly in the name of this misogynistic, hate-filled ideology, killed 10 people and injured 16 in Toronto. Or Ben Moynihan, the teenager in the UK who attempted to murder three women over a three-month period in the name of the same ideology. Um, or, for example, the teenager who walked into a Toronto massage parlour earlier this year and killed a woman with a machete. They're not isolated incidents. I've traced this specific extremist online community of ideologies to the murder or serious injury of over 100 people in the last 10 years alone. But the vast majority of people haven't heard of these ideologies and those who have to mis dismiss them as tiny internet backwaters. There are pickup artists, a related community who obviously sprawl offline as well, a hundred million dollar industry globally not that you'd know it from the media portrayal of the sort of hapless lovable rogues like barney stinson in how i met your mother but actually men who in many cases have themselves advocated rape have boasted about committing rape have videoed themselves assaulting women they don't know in public spaces and put the video online for their fans and acolytes to copy these are the so-called gurus for several thousand dollars in any major city anywhere around the world on any given weekend are training men to sexually harass and in many cases sexually assault women with their techniques like going caveman what they call overcoming last minute resistance and teaching boys who might stumble on these communities online anxiously looking for tips about girls every girl has a rape fantasy you're just playing into it one young boy i saw anxiously asking for advice about talking to a member of the opposite sex immediately was given the advice rape it then there are men going their own way, another connected community and part of the manosphere, but men who believe women to be so toxic and so incredibly dangerous and damaging that the only way to handle them is to cut them out of your life altogether, to have no contact with them sexually, romantically, or if possible in the public sphere or in the workplace. Again, it sounds extreme, but we're talking about communities, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands strong. We're talking about men whose videos about these ideologies have been viewed tens of millions of times online. And their ideas are spreading incredibly effectively through the mainstream media, through politicians, through sanitized figureheads who talk about this in academic or tabloid circles, to the extent that we end up having the idea that Me Too is a witch hunt cropping up on some of our biggest national television and radio programs. And if it sounds extreme and niche, consider the fact that 27% of American men, when recently surveyed, said that they now avoid one-to-one -one meetings with women in the workplace, or that Mike Pence, the Vice President of the United States, refuses to have dinner alone with any woman other than his wife. Then there are men's rights activists, perhaps the most acceptable face of the manosphere and the ones we're most likely to see in the news being given mainstream coverage because they pay lip service to very real issues affecting men, issues like the male mental health crisis, issues like veteran support, issues like um, male workplace injuries, but who actually devote their time and their energy to attacking and undermining women and feminism, to bringing lawsuits to try and defund women's sexual violence services, and one of these spurious lawsuits brought by a self-proclaimed men's rights activist lawyer in the States, which was against the male-only military draft, which is a real touch point for men's rights activists, when he didn't like the way that the judge handled it. Earlier this year, he turned up at her house and shot her son dead and also shot her husband. So these are online ideologies, yes, but they're not niche, they're not tiny, they're not small groups of men who never come offline or meet. We're talking about men who, in the names of these ideologies, have come offline and committed
committed real violence against women. We're talking about men who are deliberately grooming boys. What I found was that they don't just try to suck boys into their groups or forums directly. They're extremely clever. They use bodybuilding websites, which sounds odd until you realize that there is 10 times as much content on the average bodybuilding website I researched about the teen section than any other section. So it's a group that is right for the picking. You're looking for boys who are already anxious, concerned about particular ways of projecting a certain alpha male masculine image to the world. Bodybuilding websites are a very clever place to find them. They are grooming boys using gaming live streams when boys are in their bedrooms, in their own homes, but on their headsets and speaking over the internet to people they don't know. And they're very clever about using online social media like YouTube, for example. Now, it might not sound like such a big deal until you learn that YouTube accounts for 37% of all mobile internet traffic, that it's by far the biggest social media platform used by young people, and that 70% of the videos viewed on YouTube are recommended by its algorithm. You know, the videos that pop up and tell you, you know, try watching this next. So if you put those two stats together, you learn that a quarter of all mobile internet traffic anywhere in the world just consists of people watching the videos that YouTube has chosen for them. And at that point, it becomes significant that YouTube acts as a kind of radicalization machine, that its algorithm pushes you towards watching more and more extreme content because that's what keeps you watching the longer. And that alt-right, white supremacist and extreme misogynistic influencer networks have taken advantage of this as a means of radicalization. They talk about grooming boys, they talk about using jokes and memes and content online that's related to popular culture as akin to adding cherry flavor to children's medicine. And there is undoubtedly a huge overlap here between these extreme misogynistic communities I investigated and the alt-right and white supremacy. You cannot disentangle the two because they are so closely interlinked. The alt-right and white supremacists are seeing these extremist misogynistic communities as a means to pull young men in, as a kind of slip road to their own ideologies. But their ideology is also predicated on extreme misogyny, their obsession with birth rates, with replacement theory, with the idea of what they perceive as hordes of immigrant men coming in to plunder the dehumanized commodity of fragile, vulnerable white women. All of this is mixed up together and we're missing a trick if we don't try to recognize that or of course to recognize how closely these things are bound up with wider terrorist acts that so many terrorists have a background of domestic abuse of domestic violence of stalking women women are essentially canaries in the coal mines singing unheard until bigger atrocities occur if we were to take domestic violence more seriously if we were to recognize that these forms of abuse are as serious as other kinds of abuse we'd be well on the way to tackling this stuff but people haven't heard of it. When I talked to counter-terrorism organizations about the book as part of my research, I kept having to repeat the word incel and spell it out. When I talked to people about the book when I was researching it, I told them I was working on a book about incels, about these communities, and one of them said, I didn't know that you were interested in microbiology. Another one of them said, oh, is that a kind of battery? At the moment, people simply don't know that these communities exist. There is so much that we can do to tackle this problem. We could recognize it as terrorism when acts that meet every definition of terrorism are being carried out in the names of these ideologies. We could recognize what they're doing to young boys as grooming and radicalization and support schools and teachers to recognize it as they do with other forms of radicalization and support and protect young people. We could provide offline spaces for young men to have mental health support, to deal with the fact that there is no remaining youth center funding across the country, that 600 youth centers have closed. If we provided offline spaces for boys to tackle these real issues that are raised around male mental health and other problems, we'd be stopping the manosphere from being such an incredibly seductive alternative. And if we tackled gender stereotypes and domestic violence more broadly, we'd be cutting off some of this problem at its source. For me, this has come full circle, really. It's another problem I can see where I don't necessarily think that I can solve it overnight, but I also don't think that we can solve it if nobody knows it even exists. My hope is that this book is a first step towards getting people talking.